Praise the Lord. Isn't it good to be with God's people, to be able to come and to worship and praise his name? Amen. Come on, remain standing, if you will, for the reading of the word together. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, choir, for leading us in worship today. Wow, you are a beautiful congregation on this Thanksgiving weekend after Thanksgiving. What's great is that you're not asleep. You know, some people might fall asleep after Thanksgiving because they're so full. Somebody sent me a message. I think it was Steve Swinford. He said, Pastor, get out your stretchy pants. I don't know why he told me that. They were already out. They've been out for a while. I've been eating so much lately, but we had a wonderful Thanksgiving in Tennessee, and I, I trust that you did as well. You know, there are, we are, I'm always mindful that during the holidays, there are people who lose loved ones. And there are people who go through difficult times, and even in our own church, we have that even now that people are experiencing the loss of family and going through difficulty. So in the midst of our thanksgiving, there are still people who are hurting and are troubled, and we always want to remember them and pray for them. I want to talk to you today as we continue our series, This is Living. I want to talk to you on this topic today that God wants me blessed. God wants me blessed. And let me, before I say anything else about this message, I'm going to be talking about money today. So if you leave right now, I know I got you. So you probably don't want to leave till the end of the message. And so, uh, yeah, some of y'all got that. But uh, anyway, I I want to talk about this today. And let me just tell you why I'm going to talk about it, because it's important for me as your pastor to be able to share with you about how God wants you blessed. And one of the ways God wants to bless you is through your giving. Amen, Pastor. Uh, So I want you to understand that today. I'm not after your money. I want you to hear this right up front. I'm not after your money. I'm not after your money today. I don't talk about money, but maybe a couple times a year, and I don't even know if I've talked about it this year, maybe at the very beginning in January. So I'm not, if you're a guest, I don't talk about money a whole lot. But we're going to talk about it today. So I, I want you to be prepared for that. So let's turn to the book of Malachi, and then we'll also turn to the book of John 10.10. Uh, You don't have to turn to that chapter, but we'll look in the book of Malachi. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. I like this version, and so I'm going to read from it today. But I want to talk about God wanting you blessed. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to be blessed by by God. I I want to be blessed in my life. I want what God has for me. Amen. And I, I would think that you would too. So let's look at Malachi 3. The Bible says, should people cheat God, yet you have cheated me? But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me of tithes and offerings due to me. And this is what you need to understand. When you cheat the Lord, you are under a curse. For your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. This is the storehouse. I love Benny, but don't pay your tithes to Benny. (laughs) Benny ain't going to come see you in the hospital. I'm going to preach anyway. I I feel like preaching today. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my house or in my temple. He says, if you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies. I love that. I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't have enough room to take it in. Now, I don't know about you, but that's the kind of blessing I'm looking for. I still got room. I still got room. And then he says, try it. Put me to the test. So he says, try tithing, and then he says, put me to the test. I cannot find anywhere else in Scripture where God says, put me to the test. Only when it comes to tithing and giving. All right, John 10, 10. You don't have to turn, that will be on the screen for you. The Bible says, the thief, who's the thief? Enemy, the devil, right. Does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But God said, I have come that they may have life And they may have it more abundantly. One says, to the fullest. So I want to talk about God wants us blessed. Come on, let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would help me today. Father, I want to preach this message. I don't want to come across as harsh because I'm not upset in any way. Father, I just want your people to understand your word so that they can walk in favor and walk in blessing that comes from you if we are obedient to your commands. And Father, I pray today that preaching would be easy, enjoyable, and effective. The touch of the Holy Spirit would make the difference. And Father, my prayer is that we would open up our heart, our ear, our spirit, and we would be receptive to your word. And we would not just be hearers of the word this morning, but we would be doers of the word today. 
God, thank you for what you're going to do in advance in this place. And we honor you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. As you're seated, look at your neighbor and say, God wants you blessed. Amy and I trust you in your, I want to talk about uh, uh, God, God wants us blessed. Amy and I trust that you and your family had a wonderful Thanksgiving. And again, I hope you're not too, too full from eating. I know that tomorrow, we, what we call in our family, I got to flip the switch. Anybody know what flip the switch means? That means you got to do something different. You, you, you can't eat all the Little Debbie Christmas cakes that I've eaten over the last two weeks. I mean, I can't, I, I've had too many already, and we had chocolate pie. Where's that chocolate pie from? Where's that chocolate pie from? Fresh Market. How many of y'all know that's going to be in heaven? Come on, somebody. I mean, whipped cream, turkey, dressing, mashed potatoes, mama's homemade macaroni and cheese. Y'all ain't talking to me yet, are you? Hopefully you're not too upset over the ball games. Hey, listen, man. Tennessee fan, you got to be thankful for something. Bas- you know it's bad when Kentucky's good in football and their basketball team's down, and we're better in basketball than we are in football. You know end times are about to take place. Come on, somebody. But hopefully all of it was good and it went in your favor today, and I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. But last week we had a, a powerful service as we started this two-week series called This is Living. We, we, we should understand that Thanksgiving should not be celebrated just one Thursday in November out of the year, but 365 days out of the year, we should have a grateful and a thankful heart for what God has done for us. Uh, Pastor David was praying this morning, and, and, and at the conclusion of his rehearsal, he made this statement, if God doesn't do anything else for us, he's done enough for us to be thankful and to give him praise, and that is a true statement. He sent his son Jesus, and that's more than enough for us to be thankful the rest of our our lives. You see, if you missed Sunday and you haven't had a chance to watch the service from last week, we talked about the sacrifices of Thanksgiving. And there's five of those, the sacrifice of yourself or the living sacrifice or uh, the sacrifice of praise. And we talked about the sacrifice of prayer, talk about the sacrifice of possessions, which we'll focus in on today. And I talk about the sacrifice of purity. So in this series, it's just a little short two-week series that we've done, but this is the living series, and I want you to understand I've got good news and bad news today. First of all, the bad news. The bad news is the devil wants you to live under a curse. But here's the good news. God wants you to live under blessing. Amen. God wants you blessed. Listen, I believe God wants to prosper you, and you need to know that God is for you. See, the devil is about your trouble, but God is about your triumph. The devil wants you to break down, but God wants you to break through. You see, when you look at the word prosper, it means to be successfully victorious over your issues. Now, I know some of y'all don't have any issues, but there's a couple people on your row. Don't look at them. They got issues. But see, the reality is God wants you, uh, some of you looked, you weren't supposed to. Uh, The reality is God wants you to be victorious over your issues. He wants you to be blessed in your life. He wants your family to be blessed. He wants your business to be blessed. He wants your health to be blessed. Y'all ain't talking to me. He wants you to live in a time of blessing in your life. The devil wants you cursed, but God wants you to walk in blessing. Listen, I want to be victorious over the things that God wants to be victorious over. I want to be victorious over my issues. I want to walk in blessing. I want the church to be blessed. I want your business to be blessed. I want your family to be blessed. I want your children to be blessed. You can walk in blessing and God wants you blessed. And I would say that most of us, if we were asked the question, do we want to live under curse or do we want to live under blessing? We'd say blessing all day long. So here's something that we've got to understand before we get into this message. The thief, that is the devil, wants you to live under a curse, but God wants you to live under blessing. If you don't get anything else I say, you better get that. God wants you to live under blessing. See, the curse began in the garden when there was a separation, when man was separated from God because of sin. However, God had a plan to reverse the curse. He sent his son Jesus that you and I might be restored 
Lord, and that curse would be broken off of us. I'm thankful today that Jesus took my place and he was the answer to our prayer. We didn't know we needed a Savior, but God did, and he sent his son Jesus that we would be able to walk in blessing and not have to live in sin any longer. You see, God really modeled what true giving is by offering his very best gift. That is his son, Jesus. God's gift broke the curse of sin. And I believe that when we give of our financial resources, of our best giving, our tithes and our offerings, we allow God to bless us instead of living in a curse. Now, let me just tell you why the devil wants you cursed. I, I will talk about God's blessing in a minute. But let me tell you why the, God, why, why the devil wants you cursed. Number one, I, I said this a couple weeks ago, but I just want to remind you of it because it fits. He hates God and he hates you. I know I told you that a couple weeks ago when we talked about the devil in hell. But listen, the devil cannot stand you. If you think the devil likes you, you are deceived. If you proclaim to know Jesus and you're a follower of Jesus, if you're in here saying how great the Lord is and, and you worship him and, and you lift your hands and you pray and you believe God can do miracles, listen, the devil does not like that. He can't stand you. Listen, the Bible said in John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief comes except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He didn't say he comes to lift you up, to make you better, and to make you happy. That's what the thief comes to do. That's not what he said. He said he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Listen, I don't want someone in my life or around me that all they want to do is steal, kill, and destroy things about me. But God said, I've come to give you life, and I come to give it to you more abundantly. You see, that's why you need to be connected to Jesus is because Jesus has come to give you life and he's come to give you life to the fullest. I don't know about you, but I want to live life to the fullest. So you, you need to see the devil doesn't want, want you to give because he understands that when you tithe and give, you position yourself for God to bless you. That's why he says, keep it in your pocket. That's why he says, go spend it on Black Friday and don't give anything on Sunday. Let me give you three elements that you need to understand about this. Now, I'm not mad at nobody. I want to say it again. I love all y'all. I hope you love me at the end of this message. You got to to go to heaven, so you work through it right now. <laughs> Listen, the devil hates you. He hates God. Listen, the de here's three elements. Number one, the devil hates the blesser. He hates God. He hates the fact that God loves you so much and has done so much for you. The devil hates the blesser. Number two, the devil hates the blessing. He hates your breakthrough. He wants you to be in bondage. He wants you to be in an element of cursing in your life. He never wants the miracle to arrive on time. He hates the blessing. He never wants you to receive it. He'll block it if he can. But it isn't it good to know that God has all power. And at just the right time, the blessing shows up when it needs to. Amen. But see, also the devil hates the blessed. You see, remember what I told you a couple weeks ago about the devil? He hates you because you're made in the image of God. He hates you because you took his job as a worshiper and you are much better at it because you sing the song of the redeemed. You are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and the song of the redeemed is a different type of praise. I feel that. It's a different type of worship because we know we have been blood, uh, blood bought. We've been set free because of what Jesus has done for us and the song of the redeemed is a different type of song. He, uh, he, he hates you because God loves you so much. He hates you because you, he was kicked out of the place that, uh, that, that Christians are destined for. That is the place called heaven so understand that the devil hates you now go back to John 10 10 this what did it say the thief does nothing but come to accept to steal to kill destroy and he said I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly the word steal in the Greek here is the word klepto it's where we get our English word kleptomaniac the definition means an obsessive desire to steal without economic motive the, let me say it again desire to steal without economic motive. Listen, the devil does not want your money. He does not want to steal your money. He's not broke. He doesn't need it. He has no financial motive. He simply wants you to live under a curse. He wants you to live in a place of cursing. This is why God says in Malachi chapter 3, he says, try it, put me to the test. 
He said, God says, when it, when it comes to time, he says, try me. He says, try and see if I won't pour out such a blessing that you won't even have room to contain what I do for you. Listen, the devil is a good cursor, but God is a better blesser. He's a greater blesser. Come on, somebody. God is a greater blesser than the devil is a cursor. Listen, so we see, first of all, that, 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 that the devil doesn't like you. Number two, he wants the church to be poor and effective and insignificant. Ephesians chapter 5, 27, he might present to her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but he, that she should be holy and without blemish. He's talking about the church. Listen, one thing that makes the devil nervous is a blessed church. It makes him nervous. You see, when the church is blessed, that means the church people are blessed. And God wants a blessed church. He, he wants a church that is a, a glorious, a glorious church. Listen, uh, you, you see, the devil would love to keep a church in poverty, barely making it, not impacting the city, unable to reach anybody. Have you ever been to that church? I have. Thank God that's not this church. But I've been to the church that when you walk through the doors, everybody looks like they're about to die and want to die. There, are, there is no life. There's no kids running around. Uh, there, there, there's, there's nothing going on in that church. They've just come to sing their couple of songs. Hopefully the pastor will do something good to not put them to sleep. Listen, God wants a blessed church. He wants the building to look bad. He wants property not taken care of. One of the things I tell people in the ministerial internship program, and I speak to them this Saturday, I said, when you become a pastor, can you pull your weeds? Can you cut your grass outside the church? Let it be presentable because God's house should look, look like the best building in all of the city. Amen, pastor, preach on. God's house should look like the best building in the city. Because it's his house. It's a place of worship. It's a place where he is exalted. We can exalt him with our mouth, but we should exalt him with how it looks. People know what our building looks like when they drive by it. That's why it matters. People see poor landscaping. People see lights burn out. People see stains on carpet. People see outdated equipment. People see how you care for your kids. One of the greatest compliments that we have received in this building is how we have security down there by Life Kids Junior and stationed throughout this building because one man said, I came to this church and when I saw the security there, I went back and told my pastor what I saw. It spoke to me that you care about this facility and your children. It should be excellent. Here's something you have to understand. It takes money to run the church. Our budget this year was 1.8. Our budget next year is going to be 2 million. Now, for some of y'all, y'all don't even realize we take in that kind of money. We do because of the faithfulness of God and people like you who are generous in giving. But here's the reality. It should be almost. Instead of just taking in 1.9 and 2 million, we really should take in 3 million. I'm going to stick to my notes. It would be great if the bank or utility company would say, don't pay your mortgage this month. Don't pay your utility bill. But here's the thing. It comes like clockwork. We've paid the mortgage this month. We've paid utilities this month. It would be great if those companies said, you guys have fed the homeless this week. You've given out food boxes. You're helping those with addictions on Monday night. You gave Christmas shoe boxes to kids all around the world. You don't have to pay us. But that's not how it works. I, I, I don't think that's ever going to happen. If it does, I promise you, I will, I'll run around this building myself <laughs> when I tell you. But they're expecting their payment. See, I'm grateful that our church property looks good from the outside to the inside. I'm thankful that it's clean. I'm thankful that it's cared for. I'm thankful we have fresh paint. I'm thankful we got new carpet. I, I, I'm thankful that we've done our best to make sure the house of God looks good. If you haven't driven by our property at nighttime lately, you need to make a little note to self. Drive by and look how lit up this front of our building is and our parking lot. How great it is. We're going to work on the parking lot next year. Look how good it looks. Look at our landscaping. It, it looks great. And here's the thing. If you see trash in a flower bed, I, I release you to pick it up and throw it away. 
you have my permission. I'm not going to get upset if you pick up a, a bottle or a bag and say, I just feel like I got to throw this away. I'll say, glory, help yourself. Because we want God's house to look right. We want God's house to look good. Uh, you see, when we, we should want everything in his house to look amazing because whatever you do, do for the Lord, you ought to do it with everything that you have. And I don't know about you, but I want to put our best foot forward. Not just so people say, oh, wasn't that nice. It's got to be more than just a nice building. But some people won't even walk through the doors if it looks like you don't even care about the outside. Because if you don't care out there, what are you going to do when they get in? See, we gotta, it matters. It represents us. We've got to do it with excellence. See, the devil doesn't want you to give because he doesn't want you blessed. John 10, 10. Let me repeat it again in case you haven't heard it. The thief comes to steal, kill, destroy. But he said, I've come that you have life and have it more abundantly. Kill means to slay. Destroy means to ruin and to render useless or non-effective. Listen, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be rendered useless or non-effective. I believe God has called us for more. I believe God has called us to stay Stand up and make a difference for the kingdom of God and the cause of Christ in Huntsville, in North Alabama, in Athens, Alabama, wherever he's going to take us, we're going to make a difference for the kingdom. See, enemy wants you to be useless or non-effective. He wants you to be ruined. He wants you to be cursed. But God wants you to be blessed. I love the end of the verse. In the original translation, if you go back and look at this, this is a modified translation. But if you look at the original translation, there was a but in the middle of the verse. Now, a but is a conjunction. Now, uh, some of y'all remember Schoolhouse Rock, right? Conjunction, what's your function? Anyway, all right. I grew up on that. Some of y'all did too. In the original translation, there was a but. It was a conjunction. In grammar, it is a part of speech that connects words or phrases or sentences. It means that the sentence isn't over, but there's more to come. It, it, what, what, in the original translation, in the one I read, it, there's an and, but in the original, there was, there was a, a, a but. There was a conjunction that says, I know it looks like this part is over, but I want to connect the next phrase to it because it is the one that you need to understand. I'm thankful that in John 10.10 10, that God put a but in the sentence instead of ending the middle of the, sen middle of the, of, of the sentence with a period. God used the conjunction in some of our lives already, and we should remember it. Listen, I I should not be your pastor, but God allowed my resume to get to the table. You shouldn't have the job that you have right now, but God saw fit to open up the door for you to get the job offer. You shouldn't be alive today, but God showed up on the scene to make sure that you kept on living. I feel like preaching. You shouldn't be living in the house that you're living in, but God allowed the financing to go through. You shouldn't be married to that woman or that man but God gave you your spouse he created them from the beginning of time somebody ought to shout right now because God used a but instead of putting a period at your sentence thank you Jesus sit down you see the word abundantly at the end of this verse really means superior. It means extraordinary. It means surpassing. It means uncommon or unusual. I don't know about you, but that sounds like the kind of blessing that I want to live under. I want to live under an uncommon blessing, a surpassing blessing, an extraordinary blessing, an unusual blessing, a superior blessing. What, what did the Bible say in John 10, 10? He said, he came to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. That means that they may have it more extraordinary, that, that it may be surpassing, that, that, that it may be uncommon, that it may be unusual. That's the type of blessing that I believe God wants us to live in. Thirdly, he, he, he wants, the, the enemy wants money to be used for evil pursuits. Luke 16, 13 says this, no servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. There are two kinds of money. There's blessed money and there's cursed money. There's blessed money and there's cursed money. 
The people who have curse money serve their money. They serve their money. The word mammon here in this text means wealth and riches. The word serve in Luke 16, 13 means to be in bondage to or to make a God out of. That's what it means. To be in bondage to or to make a God out of. Too many people have made a God out of their money and their possessions. These people think their money and their resources are their greatest asset, but in actuality, it is their greatest liability. The devil wants you to love what you have more than the one who gave it to you. Listen, I know all that I have. Nobody has to tell me. The reason I have it is because God gave it to me. How how do you know that, Pastor? Well, when Amy and I decided to leave teaching and coaching and go into full-time ministry, Amy ran into a lady in the post office. And she made this statement to Amy. She said, if you will step out on faith and do what God has asked you to do by the way of ministry, he will supply all of your needs. That was at the beginning. Now, at the beginning, let me go ahead and tell you, it was humble beginnings. I mean, we left 55,000. I know this don't sound a lot. I wish our educators made more. But together, as teachers and coaches, we made $55,000 a year. Now, I know for some of y'all, that's big money. But that was both of our salaries together. We really both made, I think with my coaching stipend, I made twenty-seven five. dollars Rolling. My first ministerial role as a youth pastor, my total package was 28.5. We left 55 to go to 28.5. Now, simple economics will tell you that's dumb. That doesn't make sense. And I didn't realize that in the 28.5, my insurance came out. So really, my salary was 19,000. So just... Keeping up with it at home in case you've lost score. We went from 55,000 to 19. So what pastor the insurance is, okay, we went from 55,000 to 28,5. And we went believing that God was going to take care of us. And let me, can I just testify to you? That's not woe is me. Listen, I, I, I make more than I should. God has been so good to me. I'm blessed. I'm thankful how he's taken care of me. This church takes care of me and my family, our staff. Uh, you take care of our staff. We are blessed to work here and serve here. I promise you because I've been to a lot of places. I've served at a lot of great churches. I've served at churches larger than this. And I didn't make what some of our staff makes. I went to a church that ran 1,800. And some of our staff makes more than I made there. So we're blessed. That's not the point. We are blessed. The point is this. From the beginning, God said through a woman in the post office, if you will be obedient to what God asks you to do, he will supply all of your needs. Let me tell you another one. There was a lady in Oklahoma when I was preaching a youth camp. She told me, said, God is always going to provide someone to put shoes on your feet. I was like, okay, that's good. I like that. And everywhere we have gone, God has used someone to give me shoes. Y'all think that's crazy, don't you? I had a lady in Ohio, her name was Miss Betty Stinson. She would come up to me and she would hand me $200. She'd say, go get you some Johnston Murphys. Go get you some Cole Haan. If y'all don't know what those are, them are high-dollar shoes for me. Come on, somebody. I didn't pay that. I went to, like, side stores and... Got some $30 shoes. Y'all ain't going to say nothing to me, are you? I had to find the sale rack, 75% off the red dot. Come on, help me in here. (laughs) Talking to real people, I think. And so I had to find those shoes, but she would always give me $200. She said, if you don't go buy them, I'm going to take the money back. You're going to take them off and let me see Cole Haan or Johnson Murphy. (laughs) She gave it to me one week. I didn't have them by the next Sunday. She said, if you don't have them shoes on by next week, I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to take you, and we're going to buy them shoes. I said, Miss Betty, I, I, I'll do it. I'll have them on next week. And I went and bought me some Johnson Murphys, black, lace up. Y'all, mm, I mean, I was looking shining. Y'all look good. In this church, there's a man by the name of Truong Long. 
who has given me and my family multiple shoes and multiple pieces of clothing. What are you trying to say? I'm trying to say you can live under a cursing or you can live under blessing. Amen. They say, well, pastor, that works for you because you're the pastor. No, it didn't say if the pastor ties and the pastor ties. I can promise you that because I'm never going to ask you to do something that I can't lead the way on. Listen, it doesn't say if it says pastors or clergy try me, put me to the test. No, he, he made it for everybody. He said, put me to the test and try me. See if I won't come there. I am way off my notes. Let me get back to it. You see, the devil wants you to love what you have more than who gave it to you. I, I don't want to get to the place that I love the blessing more than I love the blesser. Some people fall in love with the blessing and they forget the blesser or the one who gave it to them. I pray that I never get to the place that I allow success, money, position, title ever stop me from giving my best to the Lord. In fact, the more we have, the more we should give. I figured it up. Amy and I last year gave 17% of our income away. 17%. Now, you might not think that's very much. You may give 25. Praise God for you. But there was a time that we struggled to give 10. But we gave 17%. That's, that's 10% in our tithe and 7% in offerings above that. I can tell you why I'm walking in blessing. I don't say that to brag. I need to give more than that. I want to get to the place where I can give 25% away. I'd love to give 50% away. If God gets me to the place where I can give 50% away, I'd be high rolling. You should want to give. See, my heart is to give. I want to give. I tell Amy all the time, man, I wish I had money to give to that need. I wish I had the money to give to this situation. I want to give. See, if it had not been for the Lord, I wouldn't have what I have today. Listen, money that is submitted to God is blessed money, and blessed money goes further. Blessed money goes further. I can't explain to you, but when you tithe, your money goes further. What is the tithe? It is 10% of what you make. Now, I'm not here to debate with you whether you want to give 10% of your net or give 10% of your gross. We give on gross. But if you want to, we started out giving on net. You work through it. But tithe. After paying your tithes, it's amazing to see how God allows what is left and, and, and left to, to satisfy the need. Amy and I, when we were newly married and I was still in college, she was the breadwinner. She was the teacher. I was the student. I waited tables. Her check paid all the bills. Now, forget the first time we had paid our bills together. She got her check. Man, we had a, it was a lot of money in our account. We paid the car payment, tithes first. Ties, car payment, the couple other payments that we had, and we had $25 left of her check, and she gets paid monthly. That's how educators got paid. She looked at me and started crying. She said, we only got $25 left for the whole month. I said, it's all right. I'm waiting tables this Friday night. Cash money rolling in. Cash money going to be on your table on Friday. Trying to encourage her because it looked like See, what it appears is you're about to go under, but what really, what, what really is about to happen is that God is about to propel you forward. Mm, I feel that. Listen, I know what some of you are thinking right now. There is no way if I tithe, I can make it. Well, here's my answer. I can't make it if I don't tithe. I can't make it if I don't tithe. My mom and dad, when they were younger, Dad was out of, uh, finished his service in Vietnam and was out of the army and going back to, to Lee University. They got a check for $171.40 and they made the decision because things were tight, they weren't going to pay tithe on that check. They had a problem with the washing machine and had to call a serviceman to come and look at it. And the serviceman said, well, this is not a big problem. He said, here's your problem. And he pulled out a little sock of my sister's. I wasn't born yet. Put out a little sock of my sister that said, this was your problem. This is what has caused your washer to quit working. And he said, I'm not even, I mean, this is nothing. He said, I'm only going to charge you a service call. I'm not going to charge you any labor. And when the man handed my dad the ticket, it was $17 and 14 cents. It was the tithe off the check. 
that they didn't give. See, here's what happens when you don't tithe. You won't keep it. Something will come up. You'll have to give it to somebody else. Oh, it's quiet now. That's all right. I'm going to preach on. You, 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 it'll, end up in, it'll end up somewhere else. It won't end up in your pocket. It, yeah, amen. It will. Blessed money goes further. I got to keep going. I, I got to finish up. Number four, he wants you to walk in the curse of shortage, lack, and poverty. Malachi 3, 8, 9 says, you've cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. You are under a curse. Friend, I want to tell you, you don't have to live under the curse of lack, shortage, or poverty. God has made provision for you to live in blessing. Now, look what he says in 2 Corinthians 9, 8. He said, and God is able to make some grace. Is that what he said? He said, all grace abound towards you that you sometimes, always, having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Come on, let this get in your spirit. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Now listen, I like this verse. Because I believe that when you put God first, you will have everything you need for all things. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to drive an Escalade. I, I, I looked, at those, looked at those one time and quickly flipped the page because there was like no way. It doesn't mean you're going to, but it means you're, you're going to have what you need. Here, number five. He wants you to believe that the word doesn't work, the enemy. He wants you to believe that God's work doesn't work when it comes to your money. He's okay if you believe that God can give you peace. Now, he wants to make you doubt that too. But he never wants you to accept that the word works when it comes to your money. He wants you to believe that it doesn't matter if you tithe. That's Old Testament. Well, so's the Ten Commandments. You can go murder somebody, doubt it. You can go to jail. Go try to steal your neighbor's wife. He's coming with a gun or a ball bat. I know what you say. God's, God's a gracious God. He's a merciful God. He's going to understand that I can't, I can't tithe this week. The enemy wants you to think that this portion of Scripture was, was, is not for today. Just leave that part of the word out. Ignore it. Don't submit to it. Overlook it. But I want to tell you that if you believe the word of God, you have to do it. And do it with the right heart and the right attitude. Why? Because the word works. The word works. You see, I already know that the word works. I've been living by the word of God way too long and I know that the word works in all situations in my life. Listen, the word works when it comes to healing. The word works when it comes to salvation. The word works when it comes to deliverance. The word works when it comes to peace. The word works when it comes to Holy Ghost power. The word works when it comes to praise. The word works when it comes to joy. The word works when it comes to provision. The word works when it comes to tithing and giving. I am a living testimony that when you apply the word of God to your life, it works. It's too late. I believe the word works. Psalm 35, 27 says, let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause and let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified. I love this part. Who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Now you're saying, Pastor, you're preaching a prosperity message. No, I'm not preaching a prosperity message. I'm preaching a message on blessing and cursing. But if you live under God's blessing, I believe you will prosper. How do I know? I'm living proof. I can testify to it. 
He said, let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. Let them continually have praise that the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Listen, the, one of the reasons I'm able to come in every week and lift my hands and praise the Lord regardless of what I'm going through. It doesn't mean times are tough for me. It doesn't mean that from time to time our budget doesn't get tight. Absolutely all of that. But I can come in here and say, I remember what the Lord has done and I'm going to continue to be faithful and his praise is going to be on my mouth. The word works. And that last line of that psalm says, the word, the word prosperity means that he delights in it and he is pleased with it. It means he wants to. God loves to see his kids prosper. Now let me get ready to close. Go ahead and somebody come give me some landing music. We may touch and go a couple times, but we will circle back around. I know what some of you are saying right now as I get ready to close this out. Pastor, why is it that you feel the need to talk about money? Well, I'm glad you asked. You see, Jesus talked about money quite often. In fact, 16 of 38 parables dealt with money or possessions. Consider this. There are more than 500 verses concerning prayer, nearly 500 verses concerning faith, but more than 2,000 on the subject of money and possessions. Jesus knew not that money, but the love of money has been a problem for a long time and Jesus wanted us to get it right. You see, money is actually a test from God. How we handle our money reveals volumes about our priorities, our loyalties, and our affections. We don't think nothing about spending $200 to go watch Alabama. They did yesterday. We don't think much about that. But let the bucket be passed for a special need and we got a dollar. Good preaching, Pastor. Listen, I'm not indicting anyone because you're here this morning, the Sunday after Thanksgiving. It directly dictates many of our blessings you will or you won't experience in your life with how you give. Listen, I found people who tithe and give generously never have a problem when we talk about money. The tithers never have a problem when we talk about money. They never do. The generous givers never have a problem with it. They don't have a problem. It's those who don't give that typically send me the emails and make the most noise about it. And if I go pull their giving statement, have given very little. Listen, if everyone in this church truly tithed off their income 10%, this church would never have any money issues absolutely ever. Now, let me be clear. We don't have money issues now. We don't have money issues now. God has blessed this church. But it's because we sow to missions. It's because we give to missions. It's because we tithe off the tithe. It's because we minister to the less fortunate, the homeless, the hurting, those that are down and out. It's because we love children and young people. It's because we care about those who are addicted. That's part of the reason why God has blessed this church. Listen, when I got here, and this is not about me, this is about the Lord. I'm not that good. This church has had a rich heritage of having strong financial support. But when I got here, we had about 75 to 80,000 in all of our accounts. Right now today, we have right at 700,000 in all of our accounts. Now, I say that to say this. That doesn't mean, well, we don't have to give, man. We got all kinds of money. There's a reason we have it. Because we've been good stewards. Because we give and God blesses. That's how it works. It is my responsibility and the finance committee and the servant leadership team to be good stewards of what's deposited in this house. And let me go ahead and tell you something. I will stand before the Lord. These staff guys will stand before the Lord on their budgets. But I will stand before God on how I spent the money of this church. See, y'all don't ever have to worry about that. If you give your tithe and you give your offerings, it's off you. Guess who it's on now? I'll stand before the Lord. And right now, I know I can stand before Him because I've had financial integrity. Listen, somebody the other week said, that's a member of this church, said, I want to see the finances of our church. Kim said, what do I do? I said, send it. 
Send come in, come to expense. I don't want you putting it online. But send them in, come expense through the year. Send the balance sheet at the end of October. Let them see it. If they're faithful contributors and members of the church, yeah, let them see it. We don't have anything to hide. And when you begin to hide stuff, that's when your problem comes in. Listen. I know some people are going to talk about me because I talked about money today. Well, first of all, if you talk about me, then you don't know my heart anyway. So I'm not worried about you. If you don't pay your tithe and, 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 and give offerings, you're not hurting me. You're not hurting me. You're hurting yourself. Because you're living under a curse. And because I'm obedient to the word, guess what I'm living under? Blessing. So if you say, well, I'm going to hold my tithe. Hold it if you want to. You won't keep it. It'll go somewhere else. And you say, Pastor, that's mean. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to tell you what God's word said. He said, try me. I'm not saying try me. God says, try me. Put me to the test. Listen, I found out a long time ago, people are not my source. God is. God is the source. I'm going to continue to practice financial integrity. We're going to continue to practice sowing and reaping. We sent almost 200 Operation Christmas shoe boxes. The average cost of those boxes are between $25 to $50. We sent almost 200 of those. We gave away, I don't know how many gift cards to people that we serve. That meal, that meal, that was not a budgeted item. That was just extra expense that we did on the food box Saturday where we spent about $1,200 to feed people. Your giving allowed us to do that. We're going to sow. I'll promise you this. I will never use this pulpit or this sacred desk to try to manipulate anybody. I'm never going to manipulate you. I promise you that. Because if I do that, then I'm the lowest of the low. I wouldn't do that to you. But what I promise you I will do is I'm always going to preach the truth to you. I'm going to preach God's word. Now here's how God wants to bless you. Are you ready? It's really simple. God wants to bless you and prosper you righteously. He wants to bless you and prosper you righteously see there are three ways that you can receive a blessing one is pride I deserve more it wasn't enough I'm, yeah I got a blessing but it, they should have gave me way more than that listen this church has blessed me be far beyond my wildest imagination and every time I receive a blessing from this church whew, I get emotional because I don't deserve it my dad, my father-in-law, they probably deserve it. Me, I don't know that I deserve it. But man, I'm thankful for it. You can receive a blessing in pride. You can re receive a blessing in poverty. You can feel guilty about it. How do you live in that house? It was a foreclosure. You're guilty about it. It was on sale. You feel guilty about it. Or you can receive it with a heart of gratitude. Number three, thank you, Lord. I've done my best to be faithful. And I'm grateful for your provision and your blessing in my life. Receive it with a heart of gratitude. You see, I've only received my blessings because I followed his word in obedience. And God is good to fulfill the promises of his word. Malachi 3.10 says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. This is the storehouse. This is where you pay tithes. If you want to give Jensen Franklin an offering, give him an offering. Don't give him your tithe. That's not your storehouse. This is your storehouse. So there'll be enough food in my house. If you, if you do, says the Lord of, of heaven, the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out such a blessing so great you won't even have room enough to take it in. Try and put me to the test. Ushers, get ready to serve the people. Now, you can do one or two things right here in the, in the, with this message today. You can let it go in one ear and out the other. You can get defensive and get mad today. 
Oh, you can say, God, I'm going to put you to the test. I've never done this before, but I just feel bold this morning. If you'll try tithing for 60 days, that's all of December and all of January, and you come up short, I'll give you your money back. Finance committee, servant leadership team, I'm out on a limb by myself. Y'all have to back me up. Truly tithe for 60 days. Try it. And if it don't work, I'll give you money back. Now that's bold. And you know why I can be bold? Because the word works. Now let me tell you something. If you try tithing and you just bought a brand new Escalade, I, I don't know what your budget looks like, but I'm not going to make you Escalade payment. But I'm telling you, if you will try tithing according to the Word of God, that means if you don't have a budget, you better create one in the next 60 days. Know what comes in, know what goes out. I mean, if you only make $1,500 and you have $1,200 worth of bills, you're real tight. And if your tithing's not in that number, you're even tighter. But I want you to try it. Try the Lord. See, I, I, I'm looking at some of y'all's faces. Y'all look real nervous. I'm not going to make you do anything. That's not what this is today. This is not about making anybody do anything. You know what Kendall told me? Of course, she had inside information. She knew that I was preaching on this topic today. In the, in the back of the room, she said, I paid my tithes, Dad. I'm current. I said, good. He said, well, how much did she give? Well, she only made $46. That's $4.60. That's what the tithe is. He said, well, that ain't much. Well, before you judge... I'm not going to say that. That would have been me. I'll just say it's more than what some others give on their tithe. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. This is not about me this morning. Amy, here's what I want you to do. I know you've got a tithe check. I know you've got a make room check. And I want you to write another, another offering check. $200. Write it out. Say, that's a stunt. No, it's not a stunt. The Lord told me to do it. Because here's the thing. I'm never going to ask you to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. So we're going to give our tithe, we're going to give our make room pledge, and we'll give another offering above that. You do what you do. That's what I'm supposed to do. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to hold it up. Here's what I want you to do. Say, Pastor, I don't have anything to give. Close your fist as though you got $1,000 in it. And believe God to do it. See, I believe God can give us increase when we're faithful to his word. Say, Pastor, I make $100 a week. It's $10. I make $1,000 a week. Y'all know the math on that? You got what it is? Shout it out. Smart people. Listen, there are people in this room who have tried tithing. Hear me. Have tried tithing, had never tithed before, and a check has shown up in their mailbox from years ago that they should have received but it showed up after they started tithing. Story of a lady, and I'm gonna I'm I'm go give. Drove a raggedy car, rusted out. You know, the old school where the top would, you know, kind of sag. Y'all remember them cars where the, you have to like put some thumbtacks or staples up in it? Y'all never rode in that car? I have. You know, it, Shocks were bad. You know what I'm talking about? It's bad. No air conditioning. The air conditioner was the windows down, and you had to roll them down. Y'all remember that car? Anybody ever had? Some of y'all still got it, don't you? She started tithing. God gave her a new car. She was living in government housing. God gave her a house. What are you trying to say? God said, try me, put me to the test, and see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that you can't contain it. 
If you're going to give by your phone, hold your phone up. If you're going to give online, hold your phone up. If you don't have any money to give, just hold your hand up. It's okay. Or hold up. Get an offering envelope in faith. If you don't want to do it, no worries. Those that believe God's word, join me. And we're going to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I've done my best to preach your word. God, I've done my best to preach truth to your people about giving. God, I pray today that it's now off me and it's on them because they've heard truth. God, you're a great blesser. Your word is true. And that if we'll be obedient to your word, God, you will do what you said you would do in your word. And you're no respecter of person. God, I'm grateful today for the privilege that we have to sow seed, to give to you. And Father, I pray for those who are going to try tithing over the next 60 days. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will prove yourself to them. That if they'll be smart and they will budget, but if they'll begin tithing, God, I believe blessed money goes further than curse money. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege to give. And God, we honor you. Receive our gifts now. Multiply them, we pray. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name.